am going to introduce Ryan. He is going to talk about his inclusive experiences workbook. It is in your folder. And Dr. Quinn is not only my counterpart in the Center for Positive Leadership, he's our academic director. Um, he's also Assistant Dean of Innovation and Strategy at the University of Louisville, but that is not actually two more days. Two more days. He's only has two more days in that role, <laughs> so he can devote, devote more time to the center. Um, and he's Department Chair for Management and Entrepreneurship. He has been heavily involved in the positive organizational scholarship movement, focusing many of his research questions on understanding what makes organizations and the people with them flourish, excel, and exceed expectations. Ryan has published articles in journals such as Administrative Science Quarterly, Academy of Management Review, Organization Science, Human Resource Management, Academy of Management Annals, and Journal of Management. He co-authored two editions of the book, Lift, and The Fundamental State of Leadership with his father, Robert E. Quinn. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been such a great uh, event, such great people, and such great presenters. I just want to once again, if you will join me again in thanking Lee and Bridget and Emma and Cherie for all they contributed. It feels so great for them. Um, I also, in addition to, you'll, you'll notice that for each presentation there was a tool that accompanied that and the idea of having these tools is so that you have practical, hands-on things that you can work with, that you can share with your colleagues at work, that you can use again and again. Um, as Ramey mentioned earlier, we have our new website coming out. Um, we were really hoping that our new website would be done in time for this event, but unfortunately, as projects often do, it exceeded. Uh, so we have about four weeks until it's out. So you'll notice on many of the tools, the new website is there, positiveleadership.louisville.edu. And so put it in your uh, calendars on your phone in four weeks to check and come in and see it, and you'll see, uh, you know, you can actually download the tools so you won't have just physical copies, but you can print them out and use them at your discretion as well. In pointing out about the tools, the idea was to make, make it both practical and iterable, like that you can use them again and again because they're tools. And so in addition to the tools that were presented today, there are other two, we actually have many tools at the uh, Center for Positive Leadership that we use to help people practice positive leadership. And the idea with these uh, tool workshops and presenting them is it there to help people lead with virtues? So today we're learning how to lead with inclusivity and lead with justice. But other events we have, which I'll talk about later, will uh, help us introduce tools on leading with compassion or leading with courage or leading with resilience or many of the other uh, things that are useful to people as well. And we're also starting to do, beginning with this one, it used to be we just did these tools around, hey, let's do leading with playfulness this time. And those were great, but now we're actually applying them to specific issues. So around the issue of diversity, equity, inclusion, how do we do this? And as you see on your little uh, trifold uh, centerpiece there, that in one of our upcoming events, we're going to be talking about burnout, which is a huge issue in a lot of organizations right now. And, and so it'll be how do you lead with uh, playfulness to overcome burnout? How do you lead with compassion to overcome burnout? And so on. So all of these tools are in there, and, and in addition to the tools on inclusivity and justice that you see here today, you'll notice that there are other tools that we are not talking about, but we're, which are also available in this folder and soon to be available on our website that are in there. So for example, the one that you see on the left there was created by one of our Rector Fellows, who are the researchers and developers that we uh, offer grants for every year. And so she is uh, Ronit Kark from Israel, and she developed a workshop and includes all the slides and instructor manual for helping men become better allies to women. And so that's one of the tools that's available in our website. You'll also notice that there's um, some tools that are story. So uh, Cherie just presented to us scenarios that you can talk through. My battery is running low. <laughs> so Cherie has uh, presented scenarios to us, and each scenario stops and doesn't tell you what the resolution was, and you have to figure out what it is you're going to do. In addition to this, you'll see other ones that are stories in here, and it does include the whole stories. 
And some of them were examples of things that were handled well, and other ones were things that were not handled so well. But the same thing can be done in your workplace. At the beginning of a meeting, you can sit down and say, all right, we're not going to talk about all of these. That would take our whole meeting. But let's take one and talk it through. In her book, uh, Mary Gentili wrote a book called Giving Voice to Values. And one of the uh, bits of research that she mentions in there is when people actually stand up and give voice to their values, I don't think we should do this, or I think this is a great idea and we should do this, or whatever it is, that, or I think we need to question what's going on here, or can we highlight that a little bit more? A lot of people struggle with expressing their voice and speaking up in organizations, and, and a lot of research has tried to figure out what makes a difference on that. And one of the things that has been found is that when people grew up and they discussed possible scenarios with respected adults, they were more likely in their own adulthood to actually speak up and give voice to values. Well, that's great for those who are kids and still have that opportunity. Parents take that in mind. But that also can work for us if we start talking through these scenarios ourselves. Because one of the reasons why people speak up and, and do these kinds of things is because prior to talking about it, they didn't think it through, and they don't know what they could do. And once you've actually thought it through, then when those situations come up, you're more likely to know what's an appropriate way for me to handle this. So if we want to do this in our workplace, then using the scenarios, using the stories, talking about them, what would you do? What would you do differently? What would you do the same? Helps us to be more prepared and more courageous to stand up and do those things when it comes. And then finally, there's also um, research in there that have been done by other rector fellows on handling these kinds of situations. So before I dive into my own tool that I'm going to be presenting today, I just wanted to let you know what the other tools are in there. They're available for use both here and then soon to be available online through our website. And I just wanted to make sure we acknowledge that. So we're going to be diving through the tool that has the balloons on it today. It's the Inclusive Experiences Workbook. If you want to pull it out, I'm going to give you a brief, hopefully brief introduction before we dive in. And then um, from there, when we dive in, I'm actually going to have us work on it together and try it out. So with that in mind, let me tell you what I learned last summer. Last summer, you know, I'm, I'm an avid book listener. I have my Audible account. I'm always getting new books. And, and, uh, and many of you are familiar with the 1619 Project book that uh, addresses a lot of racial inequity issues in the United States. And, um, it's been a controversial book in the United States as well for uh, various reasons, and I thought, you know, rather than have, develop an opinion about a controversy without reading the book, maybe I should actually read the book and develop my own opinions about it. I personally thought the book was well done. Uh, there, there may be points that I might quibble with, but overall, I thought it was pretty well done. Um, but there was a pattern in the book that stood out to me as I read it that um, was very striking. And the pattern was that as it reviewed the history of the United States, starting in 1619, that what would happen is, you know, the status quo was not desirable. We were in a state of slavery and, and exploitation and so forth. But disruptions would happen. Something would be done to try to, uh, with that disruption, it opened up the possibility of taking some action. Usually the action was some form of law or policy. And then, for the next however many years, people would work to undermine that law or policy until people started to wonder, how much progress did we really make? So there would be an amendment that would be created to the Constitution. And uh, let's say the voting rights um, for African Americans uh, in society. And then uh, people in certain states would make laws that would say, uh, well, actually, you have to have a grandfather that was educated in order to vote, or you have to, and then it would completely undermine the point of giving voting rights to people. And this just happened over, it was like a real pattern <laughs> in the book, and I was like a little bit depressing to see how that process would unfold. Why do I mention this in regards to an ex uh, inclusive experiences workbook? Well, I think a lot of this has to do with culture, and I want to talk about how this works. So some kind of policy or law or whatever happens, those who have power and that power has been threatened get angry, and they undermine and work around that, and then that either leads to uh, more policy to try to fix it or other policies that you know, help to undermine it or whatever else, and it seems to go on in this, in this cycle. 
There is a quote in the business literature, it's sometimes been attributed to Peter Drucker, but I don't think that they've ever actually firmly said this is where it comes from, but they say culture eats strategy for breakfast, and it's been applied to other things as well. Culture eats policy for breakfast, culture eats technology for breakfast. It, it just tends to, if we don't address the culture, if we use other kind of interventions to deal with things when culture is the problem, then culture tends to undermine what we're doing or people work around it or other problems come up. And so as a result, I think we need to examine this pattern in our society from a cultural perspective. So really quickly, culture are the shared beliefs that drive our actions and our experiences and it's implicit, assumed, we're unaware of it, and it gets reinforced by those actions and various beliefs in society. And so here I specifically depict it in this way as a, a circular idea. Um, this model is uh, similar to the one in the Change the Culture, Change the Game book, which I do recommend. I think it's a great, well done book on culture change. Uh, but they tend to treat it kind of as a pyramid and I took it out of the pyramid model and put it into this circle here because I wanted to convey that reinforcing idea. So when they talk about changing culture, then the idea is start with the results you want. And how are they different from the results you're getting right now? W. Edwards Deming from the uh, quality movement back in the 80s and the 90s was famous for saying, every organization is perfectly designed to be getting the results it's getting right now. If that makes you depressed about your own organization, that's fair, but it also is a way out of it, right? Is the, there's different ways to think about and design things. Start with the results you want and the results you have now and ask what actions are leading to those results? What actions would we have to have if we want to get to the new results? That's a very logical, useful question. The problem is, is most managers stop there. Once you actually get that, you're like, oh, I want these results and I need these actions. What do you think most managers do? Wild guess. <laughs> How do they try to implement the actions? Force. We make a policy. We tell people they have to do it or else they're going to get fired if they don't do it. And we try to make people behave that way. However, if I am compelled against my will, I'm of the same opinion still. And so the minute you're not forcing me, observing me, watching me, trying to get me to do it, or having some policy around me, what am I going to do? Get out of it, undermine it, not follow anymore, whatever it is. And so there becomes the big problem as we keep trying to solve things by making people do things. That doesn't mean that policy isn't important, that laws aren't important. It is, but we might want to think a little further first. If these are the actions we want, but these are the actions we're getting right now. Why? What beliefs are driving the actions we're getting right now? What beliefs are driving the, would drive the actions we want to get? And where do beliefs come from? And here beliefs is a little bit misleading because we tend to think about beliefs as a statement that I can formally say. These are the beliefs that are the unconscious, unquestioned, reactive, kind of think of them as a script. In my mind, when X happens, I do Y kind of beliefs. And once I can actually name those and put words on them, I can actually do something about them. And we learn these unconscious beliefs through socialization or the experiences we have. And that's where the real point of intervention for leaders is, is not in controlling the actions, but in changing the experiences that our people are having experiences that teach them to believe something different than what they believe right now. So that's what we're looking for is how do we change the experiences that our people are having in a way that will actually change their beliefs. That moves us from policy that controls to policy that educates, but it also means we need to pay attention to other experiences that people have in addition to policy. What other experiences might be causing what we have now, how might we change those experiences to get different beliefs? So I put this all together as a setup. On one hand, this model is really useful if you're the leader of the organization and you can go out and, and run the process and do it yourself. But what if I'm not the leader? And what if I'm just a person who's, you know, 
wants to make a difference, but I can't control whether my boss does this or that, or whether my CEO does this or not, or whatever else. Has anyone here ever heard of John Woolman? Most people haven't when I ask that question. John Woolman was a Quaker who lived in the 1700s in the U.S. colonies, and early in his experience, he had a dilemma that was presented to him. On one hand, most Quakers at that time were slave owners. On the other hand, John had had some experiences early in his childhood that made him an enemy to slavery. He wanted to continue to be a part of his religious community, and he believed the beliefs of his religious community, but it didn't fit with what he saw in the practice of slavery, and he had to figure out what to do about that. He could have ignored it. He could have raged against the machine. Instead, he took a very different approach. He spent his adult life walking the length and breadth of the U.S. colonies visiting a house here, visiting a congregation there, visiting a farming community there, and asking them simple, profound, non-judgmental questions. What does it mean to you as a person to own a human being? What effect might it have on your children to will a human being over to them? And then he'd stop and listen and talk, and then he'd go to the next farmhouse or the next congregation or whatever it is. The net effect of, now notice, John Woolman was not the head of the Quaker church. He was not the CEO. He was not the president. He was just a someone who was passionate about what he wanted to do. The net effect was that a few years after John Woolman passed away, the Quaker religion became the first religion in the burgeoning United States to completely denounce and renounce the practice of slavery. No other religion did that at that time. <clears throat> now, historians look back, his journal is considered one of the great literary works of American society. You can go look it up. It's one of the few publications from that time that is still in publication. When you go back and, and you look at it as a historian, it's almost impossible to look at that and not ask, how would the world be different today? <laughs> how would the Civil War have been different, the Civil Rights Movement, the issues we're still dealing with today over the past few years, be different if there had just been five or maybe 50 <laughs> John Woolmans who were giving people different experiences. You'll notice that the Quakers John Woolman didn't advocate until the policy was made. The Quakers changed their own policy because their culture had been changed and they didn't believe that anymore. Not that the policy isn't important and not that the policy doesn't sometimes change beliefs, it does. Just that the culture was attended to as well. So, with that in mind, <clears throat> what I want to do today is have you open that workbook and say, what are some experiences, what's an experience that I can create that's just one experience? Now, with that in mind, one experience may not change the world. It may, right? Sometimes one experience actually has a huge impact on the hinges of history are sometimes very small. But even if an experience that I create is not world-changing, at a minimum, it will be a learning experience. My efforts to create a more exceptionally inclusive experience for you, for this group, for this event, for this conversation, for whatever it is, even if it's not successful, will still help me to learn so that the next time I try to make a good inclusive experience, it'll be better. And that's the uh, learning effect of what we're talking about. So the first step, if you walk through it, the first uh, page or so it just describes how to do it and some of the underlying principles in case you don't get to come and hear me talk about it, uh, but you just want to um, <clears throat> share it with somebody and they can read about it for themselves. But then when you get to step one, it says consider experiences. So the first thing is get out your calendar or a task list and write down every episode that you see that has the potential for inclusion or uh, exceptional inclusion or for exclusion. 
don't worry about choosing it. First, just look. And one of the things that you might see, just from this portion of the exercise alone, is that experiences that on the surface I don't initially see as having to do with exclusion or inclusion, actually there might be a lot more than we realize once we start thinking about it, especially as Sheree was talking about as we move beyond our typical categories. Yes, this should apply to issues of race and gender and so forth, but it can also apply to just relationships or personalities or all kinds of other things as well once we start thinking what does it mean for me to be inclusive. So please take a moment, get your stuff out, and just generate a handful of things that you might put on that list. If it's helpful, I went through the exercise myself with a, a, some of my own. So there's an example of what it looks like when I did it. I made a list and then I ranked it as to potential impact from trying to be exceptionally inclusive. Sorry, was that a question? Rank is the oh, <laughs> for me, I put one as like the most inclusive and then lower numbers down, but as long as you know what your rank is, you can do rank in whatever order you want. All right, once you get like, I don't know, five, give or take a couple down, then go ahead and try to rank them. Which one do you think would have the best impact? So specifically, if I were to make this exceptionally inclusive, what might have the biggest impact in terms of people's experiences and that, how that affects their beliefs? Yes, was there, oh, thank you. So yeah, so in this case, and you can do it whatever order you want, but in this case, for me, I'm gonna talk to you about my experience in planning for this training retreat, because I felt like that was gonna be the highest impact one. Yep. All right, moving ahead here. I'll walk this way around. Once you've done it, so in this case, as I look through, I have an event coming up where I'm going to be training a bunch of administrators at a public school system not here in Louisville. And I felt like that's a high impact one for me. The next question, if you flip to step two in the workbook, before we try to create extraordinary inclusion, let's look at what kind of exclusion we might anticipate as we think about this event. So specifically, are there individuals or groups that we think have a higher than, have a reasonable chance of feeling excluded in some way in this activity? How might they be? It might be what are some of the unique characteristics that might be reasons for feeling excluded? In some cases, these might be the standard ones. It might be race or gender or uh, ability or um, sexual orientation or some of the normal ones, but it might also be that there's other reasons why people might feel excluded in the situation. It may be that it's the first time they've been invited to this meeting and therefore they're going to be insecure coming to it because they don't know how they fit in or it could be any number of things. So what are the characteristics that are reasons? What are past experiences? 
So uh, we talked about uh, anticipated uh, injustice in Cherie's presentation and how the reason why people anticipate injustice is because they've had bad experiences with it in the past. If that's the case, then they're going to, that's, those are some experiences I should take into account as I think about this. Things that people might say or do. So as I look at the composition of this meeting or if I look at the interview I'm about to have or if I look at the other activities I'm a part in, there are some people who just tend to say things that aren't going to, or, or do things that are going to make people feel excluded. If I know that, can I anticipate it and do something about it in advance so that that's less likely to happen or I mitigate the effects or whatever it may be? And then finally, structures that might make people feel uh, excluded in this situation. So um, the first one that comes to mind is one that Emma and I talked about when we were prepping for this event together. but. Uh, she talked about the COVID, uh, what's the name of it again, Emma? The, the medical device that, um, the pulse oximeter, which basically was developed to help people with uh, diagnosing COVID, but it was tested on people with white skin, and so it gave inaccurate results for people with black skin. Invisible structure until it started seeing the anomalies and the bias in the results, and then we had to do something about that. There are those that, that's an example of an actual physical structure in the form of a machine, but there's also social structures that might make people feel uh, excluded in this situation. It might be just um, what college somebody went to and how that affects, even if that college is more likely to affect somebody from a lower, so, uh, is likely to be one attended by people from a lower socioeconomic status. Do we pay attention to that in terms of thinking about structures that might make people feel excluded? So if you look at this, as I think about my own event that's coming up uh, in a couple of weeks that I was uh, doing this, some of the groups that matter that are going to be there, now you'll notice one of the things that's interesting is I put school administrators in this particular district, I think Latinx administrators, there's a subgroup in there that I need to pay particular attention to. Also, in public school systems, it tends to be actually the other way around. It tends to be female dominant rather than male dominant. And some males might feel excluded in that situation. Uh, also, you'll notice this is going to be a, um, an event that's about administrators. I put teachers, students, and parents in there because they're not there. And so including people who are not present might also be people who feel excluded. And am I thinking about them and what it means to include them even if they're not going to attend? <clears throat> Characteristics, you'll notice some of the different things I put in there that might lead people, past experiences, so on and so forth. Just getting me thinking about this ahead of time because if I'm not prepared for these things, then I'm probably not going to be able to mitigate their exclusion. So on page, or on step two, take a moment and try to walk through that and see what you can anticipate in your own event.
All right, the next step after anticipating exclusion is to generate inclusion. And to do this, we need to think about it in a couple of ways. One is in the previous page, the previous step, we identified a number of things. It could be obstacles to, or obstacles to inclusion or basically things that might create exclusion. As a result, take the ones that you think are most likely to happen. Maybe if they're all likely to happen, it's a long list or whatever it may be. But what are they and how am I going to overcome them? Can I anticipate going and talking to this person who always says rude things, and I know you don't, but you know, and working with her ahead of time to make sure that she doesn't? Can I anticipate like what structures are in place and how I'm going to address those before the uh, experience starts in some way? Whatever it is, what are my ideas for overcoming it? And then, just because I overcome exclusion doesn't mean that I've created an inclusive event. I have to go on the other side and make sure that we're actually thinking ahead and really saying, what can we do to make you feel special, like you belong, like you're a part of what we're doing, that we want you here and you are valued because you are a part of what we are doing. What makes it exceptional? To help with that, you'll notice there's a lot of starter ideas. This is a two-page step because it has lots of starter ideas to help with that process of ways that you can address the past or deal with implicit or explicit bias, ideas for altering or adapting structures, ideas for just making it exceptional. Some of them are going to apply to your situation. Some of them aren't. They're just starter ideas to help get going on this. But the idea is if we can move beyond eliminating exclusion, and even move beyond just, hey, let's be inclusive, but do it exceptionally, then we're more likely to change people's beliefs so that this becomes a part of what we do, whether, I'm not, whether or not I'm the CEO or the president or the provost or whatever it may be. So, in terms of my own experience that I was planning, I focused on not being consulted and not being present as two critical things that I needed to address. That means I should coach the central administration on listening to people and asking them to speak first. I should assign people to speak for those who are not present. And I can design the event so it begins with the celebration activity of the things that make people's unique contributions uh, important in this situation. I can ask people for stories, and when they share them, I can not just say, good story, but actually pull things out of your story and tell you why they're a contribution and why I care about them. And those might help me to create this as an exceptionally inclusive event. So take a moment, look at your own, and see what ideas you can generate. All right, now before we go on to the final step in this process, let me just open this up for a minute. Did any of you have any interesting insights you'd be willing to share from our brief attempt to walk through this process? What insights occurred to you? What questions occurred to you? What learnings happened just from trying to walk through this process and make myself think in this way?
strategic in thinking like who wasn't in the space too. So like kind of looking at like who exactly like any decisions that are made according to like the impact factor, but like also looking at those too, like how that representation is going to end up making them feel like who's going or not in the room. Thank you. For anyone who didn't hear, she said she really appreciated the strategicness, if that's a word, of um, thinking about the people who aren't there. And this is something that, you know, in some level is, is a great idea for management in general, <laughs> to think about who's not present. A lot of times, especially if you are in a relatively high position in an organization, maybe leave, really simple, but one thing is leave five minutes at the end of the meeting to ask who needs to know about this and what message are we gonna give to them and who's gonna get it out to them. That does a lot to make people feel included. So thank you. Other observations? Yeah. It's more like a question. Please. <laughs> so we have a strategic plan for a solution to something that hasn't been working well. But at what point do you say, this is just not a good idea, let's leave it behind and work on something else? Are you saying in general strategic plan or this plan in particular? This plan in particular. So let's say we have initiative and we keep trying working on it. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and I don't think the answer is going to be the same for every situation. And so, as a result, I think one thing that's helpful, one thing I was going to do, and I, I, we won't because we don't have as much time, but after we had uh, finished trying to fill this out, I was going to have you all get in pairs and ask each other for feedback. And I think that as you go through you know, this feedback, if you say, hey, here's what I'd like to do, here's what I'm going to try, get some feedback, make it better, go out and do it, and see you know, what works. And then, um, like Bridget talked about in her presentation, you'll notice the front side was, this is the, what we intend to do. The back side is, uh, this is what actually happened. By comparing that, we learn from it. We say, that's a good point at which we say, should we try this again? Should we not try it again? Do some of these, uh, for example, the starter ideas? We tried the starter, this starter idea in this situation and it did not work. Does that mean that that doesn't work on our organization and we should never do it again? Or does that mean we just shouldn't do it in this event or this kind of event? But I highly recommend what Bridget started us with in terms of these after action reviews because these are, every one of these is a learning opportunity. And the effort to learn from it means that the next time I attempt this, it's gonna get better and we're gonna learn from it. In fact, Jumping ahead a little bit, if you look at the last uh, page, second to last page or last page? Second to last page except for the end notes, you'll notice it has additional resources. And then the one that's uh, depicted there is a smartphone application. So at the Center for Positive Leadership, we've developed a smartphone application called the Leadership Amplifier. And what it is, is it's a more elaborate version of what we're doing here today. It allows us to look at multiple virtues, but it allows us to create communities or learning teams of people who try things out together, put their ideas in, give each other feedback, report on how it went well, so that not only can I learn from giving myself feed, or getting feedback from the event, I can also learn from my, com my learning team who gives me feedback and ideas on how to do it better. So if you're interested on in practicing together in a team, then the app is a good way to uh, take this idea and blow it out to a larger scale for thinking about it more. So I don't, I don't know if there is one principle for assessing it, but I do think that uh, it absolutely should be part of a learning process. Um, in a lot of ways, I think about it like entrepreneurship. When you, uh, it used to be people would just develop a product, put it out on the market, and it succeeded or failed. Now the wisdom among entrepreneurs is to create a minimally viable product. What's the smallest, least expensive thing that we can do to just get it out there and see how the market responds and then fix it and then try again and fix it and try it again. Same principle here is our market is the world and our product is inclusivity and we're gonna try a little experiment and learn from it and try again until we get better and better at it over time. So great question, thank you. The last step, watching my time here, is to take what you put in the first three steps and now make an actual plan. What does this look like in our experience as we put it together? And so um, I just encourage you, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna do it here, but to encourage you to actually walk that through and say, what's my plan in this situation? Um, the other things that I wanna mention really quickly before we finish, jumping all the way ahead here, um, is that 
these tools that we offer are just the beginning. So in addition to this tool, this workbook is a way to begin learning it. I mentioned the Leadership Amplifier. Another initiative in the Center for Positive Leadership is we're creating what we're calling teams of local world changers. And these teams are, are larger products. We're, uh, we're looking for sponsors who uh, support teams as they go through and take on projects. And we help develop them in leadership uh, in positive leadership so that they can magnify and enhance their impact in whatever project. Some will take on projects within an organization, like reducing burnout in the organization where I work. Others will take on community ones. So we've been engaging people in discussions about violence and how do we address violence in the community and what would a project look like for them and how would we sponsor a local world changer team on managing that. And so it may be that there are issues around inclusivity and justice that we can create teams for. There are other tools for leading with other virtues. Uh, we've freed our website, but all of these tools and all these things give us opportunities to expand, enhance, deepen, and grow our impact in what we do. And we encourage you to look on them, especially when our website is done. Um, and then also, in conclusion, let me, if, if this was a a useful and helpful event for people today and, and learning. We are continuing to develop and, and provide these events. And so I encourage you to look at the QR code and uh, see what you can pull off there. But we have, for example, Manuela Lara is a woman from Colombia. She's an artist who has gone out and find indigenous women who are changing their communities by helping educate the children or uh, cleaning the water for this village or whatever it is. And she depicts them in art and puts it into the uh, web, the World Wide Web, so that people can see what they're doing and their work can't be squashed because now they're getting larger support from broader uh, people. And she's gonna come and talk to us about what she does. Our next tool showcase, like today, we're gonna, as I mentioned earlier, is gonna address burnout and so, um, Brad Shuck is going to help us see how to address burnout by leading with compassion. And uh, uh, Melissa Brock is going to talk to us about uh, addressing burnout by leading with curiosity. Daniel Montgomery is going to talk to us about addressing burnout by leading with playfulness. And uh, Patty Whiter is going to uh, help us learn how to address burnout by leading with humility. And, all, and so we'll have a similar event to the one that we have today to address the issue of burnout as we move forward. So we hope that this has been helpful for everyone today and we'll hope that you'll enjoy it and continue to join us, whether it's in using our tools, coming to our events, or otherwise engaging with us in the various things that we do. Thank you for your time today.